Hey, good evening. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz coming to you from Los Angeles, and we are less than 24 hours away from former President Donald Trump turning himself in as part of his second indictment, this time on federal charges. And someone who knows both Trump and the law had some thoughts. If even half of it is true, then he's toast. I mean, it's a it's a pretty it's a very detailed indictment, uh, and it's very very damning. Plus, drivers on the East Coast could be facing months of traffic delays after part of one of the country's most used highways collapses. Uh, everyone's just gonna have to adjust. We're probably gonna have to wake up a little earlier, show up on time. And some incredible video showing rescuers coming across the four children who miraculously survived a plane crash and 40 days in the Amazon jungle, all using their indigenous knowledge of the land to survive. They know the jungle, how to survive in the jungle. And right now, all eyes are on Florida, where tomorrow we're going to see, for the first time, a former president of the United States appearing in federal court facing felony counts, 37 of them tied to the mishandling of classified documents. Now, Donald Trump arrived in South Florida this afternoon, and over the weekend, the former president had a lot to say about the charges facing him. The ridiculous and baseless indictment of me by the Biden administration's weaponized Department of Injustice will go down as among the most horrific abuses of power in the history of our country. Many people have said that. Democrats have even said it. This vicious persecution is a travesty of justice. Back in Washington, Trump is being defended by top Republicans on Capitol Hill. That includes House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who answered a bunch of questions about the indictment for the first time today. The idea of equal justice is not playing out here. And so that's a real concern to all Americans. So and I do believe, George, that most people on my side of the aisle believe when it comes to Donald Trump, there are no rules. And you can do the exact same thing or something very similar as the Democrat and nothing happens to you. Meanwhile, the former president is calling for protests outside of the Miami courthouse where he is expected to speak after his first court appearance tomorrow. Supporters started to show up today. Our Gabe Gutierrez spoke to a few of them. Take a look. This looks very much like you're going after a man who is Joe Biden's primary opponent. It looks like a witch hunt. This is what it looks like to me. Should the former president have had those classified 1,800 boxes and uh, Biden having having all these boxes in Delaware from Chinatown all the way to Delaware uh, next to a Corvette, I believe it was. And what if, you know, he were convicted? Would you still vote for former President Trump even yes, if I he would. were convicted? Mm -hmm. There's going to be a large turnout of supporters at the courthouse from all over the U.S. So it's going to be a sight to behold. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez joins us live from Miami. Gabe, uh, we've seen the former president calling for protest tomorrow, right? Earlier, we heard from the mayor of Miami about security preps. Uh, let's take a quick listen to that. We obviously believe in the Constitution and believe that people should have the right to express themselves. Um, but we also believe in law and order. And we know that uh, and we hope that tomorrow will be peaceful. We encourage people to be peaceful in, in them demonstrating uh, how, they're, how they feel. And uh, we're going to have the adequate forces uh, necessary to ensure that. And Gabe, based on everything you've seen today, what do you think is going to happen tomorrow? Well, Gotti, that is the huge question right now. We are right now outside of the former president's uh, resort and golf club here in Doral, Florida. And this is where he has been uh, overnighting over the last few hours. He has been undertaking a series of radio interviews where he has remained defiant, Gotti. And he says that he will plead not guilty tomorrow. He says all he's going to say tomorrow is not guilty because he has done nothing wrong, uh, he argues. He's also called his former attorney general, Bill Barr, a coward for the, the comments that Barr said yesterday, basically saying, how serious these charges were with what it, what uh, happens tomorrow remains uh, a question in terms of how many people might show up. You just hold, heard Miami authorities there saying they're prepared for potentially thousands of people. We have no confirmation that that's exactly how many people will be here. But what we can tell you, Gotti, is that a local chapter of the Proud Boys has put out a flyer online 
asking for people to come and protest. And of course, the former president has called for protests himself, although he has stressed that they should be peaceful. Local authorities, though, are prepared uh, for any violence. They hope, of course, that that does not happen, but they will be prepared for the worst, as they were two months ago when the former president was indicted in lower Manhattan, Gotti. And, Gabe, we know there's been a shakeup on who's actually representing him in court. Uh, any idea on who's that finally settled on? Well, the local council has yet to be announced, Gotti, and that is another outstanding question that we hope to learn more about by tomorrow. What we do know is that heading up Donald Trump's legal team is Todd Blanche. He's a well-known white-collar attorney who has represented him before. We understand, according to a source familiar with the travel plans, is that he was on the plane with Donald Trump coming down here uh, to South Florida. But the question will be, Gotti, which local council will represent him? Two of his attorneys resigned abruptly late last week after these uh, charges were unsealed. And as of now, again, is a question which local counsel will represent him. If he does not have local counsel, there is a possibility that the arraignment portion of tomorrow's court appearance might be postponed. He would still appear as part of a first court appearance, but the arraignment portion where he would enter a plea could potentially be postponed. At this point, it's still an open question whether that will happen. Got it. We'll see what tomorrow brings. Gabe, thanks so much. And a big stretch of I-95 is expected to be closed for months after a tanker caught fire and exploded, collapsing part of the highway. Now, I-95 is like the busiest route from Philly to New York City, and to lose a part of that interstate in both directions is a huge deal. All of it happened early yesterday morning when a gas tanker headed north from Philadelphia crashed and caught on fire. With drivers fil filming that chaos from pretty close up, you can see it right there. Once the road collapsed, the tanker and its driver were lodged under concrete and steel. A Pennsylvania state police say they have recovered a body at the scene, but no word yet on the person's identity. And NBC's George Solis is there now. George, this is devastating. When you see the aftermath, it almost looked uh, like that explosion caused all this, but that's not what caused the collapse, right? Yeah, Gotti, it's absolutely devastating. The heat from that explosion was so intense that it caused the northbound lanes to collapse. Now, today we learned that heat also compromised the southbound lane, so it, too, will now have to be demolished, causing more delays on already a pretty destructive traffic scenario, frankly, for this 95 corridor. Now, 160,000 people use this portion of 95 daily, so you can imagine what that's going to do as they have to knock all of this down and rebuild it. Now, today, uh, Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro did sign that emergency declaration to bring federal funds here as quickly as possible. You also had Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg affirming his commitment to helping rebuild this crucial piece of infrastructure. This piece of 95 connects all the way down to from Florida all the way up to Maine. So, again, that tells you just how critical and how important this portion of 95 is. And as you mentioned, the investigation is ongoing. Preliminary reports say that the NTSB should be done with their investigation in about two to three weeks. So that should give us a little bit more perspective on what may have happened here. But there's still a lot of questions about what led to all of this. But in the meantime, we know that the traffic nightmare really just unfolding, Gotti. So the investigation, two to three weeks, any word on how long it could possibly be before that's back up and open? Yeah, so right now with the detours, we know that the traffic problem here is going to be at least several weeks. But yesterday, uh, Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro saying the repair work here is going to take months. And that is a best estimate. That was before they knew they were going to have to knock down the southbound lanes, which is what you're seeing behind me. So that timeline could obviously fluctuate a little bit more. But with that federal funding and with all hands on deck, they are hoping that the impact here will be minimal. But at this point, it just seems unlikely. So Pennsylvania drivers and, frankly, drivers all across the country should prepare to find alternate routes until all that work is done, Gotti. And alternate routes. I mean, this is such an important connector. It is going to impact so many people's plans. Uh, what are the detours running right now? Any, any word on how long people are waiting to go through some of those detours and seeing that traffic back up? 
Yeah, and keep in mind, we're about to enter the summer months, so it's only going to get much worse. Pennsylvania is doing a pretty good job, and Philly itself doing a pretty good job with finding alternate routes here along the city, especially where 95 connects. Public transportation is going to play a key role in this as well for people that need to get from point A to point B. But this is going to be an ever-evolving situation uh, as they figure out how much longer it's going to take to start some of the rebuild and repair uh, and how quickly they can fight alternate routes throughout the city as more traffic starts to pick up and as more people become aware that this portion of 95 will be out of commission for the time being. Gotti. And tonight with wet weather out there to boot. George, thanks so much. Let's go now to Utah, where we are learning some key new details in the murder case against Corey Richens. That's the mother of three who allegedly poisoned her husband last March. Now, Richens is accused of spiking her husband's drink after he was found dead with five times the lethal dosage of fentanyl in his system. And today, in a new court filing, the prosecution team is revealing some questionable Internet searches allegedly made by Richens. From what is a lethal dose of fentanyl to if someone is poisoned, what does it go down on the death certificate as? Now, remember, this is the same woman that made the rounds on local TV just a few months ago, promoting her new children's book on grief. My kids and I kind of wrote this book on the different emotions and grieving processes that we've experienced last year. And today in court, Richens was denied bail after the judge deemed her a danger to herself and others. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin has been following this case closely for us and joins us now. Uh, Aaron, today was an emotional day in court. Uh, what happened? Yeah, the judge, as you mentioned, siding with the prosecution, ruling that she was a substantial danger to her community if she was allowed out on bail. It was a culmination of an extensive detention hearing. Multiple witnesses were called. A victim impact statement was read by Eric Richens' sister, Amy. It was an emotional statement in which she lashed out at Corey. Take a listen. I may be naive but I never knew evil like this existed. If Corey was in fact willing to kill Eric for money, who's to say that she, what she will not do, who would be next? Now, Corey Richens appeared to get emotional multiple times during this hearing, during the victim impact statement, as well as when a prosecutor read out her text messages that she sent her best friend shortly after she says she discovered Eric Richens' body. She was openly appearing to be emotional, her eyes watering, although a detective later pointing out that there were no signs that she performed CPR on Eric, despite the fact that those text messages indicated that she did try to save his life. Now, uh, apart from those text messages, I mean, these internet searches, right? So this one, what is a lethal dose of fentanyl? These are things that were being searched on Google or on the internet from a computer that she had access to, is that right? Yeah. This, this this all happened after Eric Richens died. She searched a number of different phrases, including luxury prisons for the rich, how long does life insurance take to pay, and can the FBI find deleted text messages. Now, the prosecution is arguing that these phrases are incriminating. The defense is arguing otherwise in their uh, court documents that they filed, saying, quote, her search history is merely in response to what was happening with the investigation, not evidence as of guilt as the state asserts. They're saying that when she, uh, when she searched for those phrases, uh, she knew she was being looked at as a possible suspect. And so that would, so she's not contesting that she looked up luxury prisons. They're saying that it was because she might have already been a suspect. Well, that is what the defense has outlined in their court filings. Wow. Wild, wild case. Aaron, thanks so much. And we've got a lot more ahead this hour, including a story that just sounds like a movie. First, their plane crashed. Then they were stranded in the Colombian jungle for 40 days. But these four kids miraculously survived, one of them only 11 months old. We're going to tell you how they managed to stay alive. You are not going to want to miss this one, so stay tuned. Hey, welcome back. And Around the World begins tonight with the death of former Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi. Now, for better or worse, Berlusconi left his mark on just about everything he touched. As a businessman, he formed Italy's largest media company before using his fame and wealth to become the country's longest-serving prime minister, despite a number of sex scandals and corruption charges over his three terms. He was 86 years old. 
And Nicola Sturgeon, the former leader of Scotland, was arrested yesterday. Then, according to police, she was released a short time later without any charges pending further investigation. Now, that investigation is digging into the finances of the Scottish National Party, which is accused of diverting $750,000 that had been raised to campaign for Scottish independence. Sturgeon resigned earlier this year. The White House says China has been spying on the U.S. from Cuba since at least 2019. Now, that statement comes after newly declassified information, and it also comes after the White House denied a recent Wall Street Journal report that China and Cuba had reached an agreement to put an electronic eavesdropping facility in Cuba. Finally, to the Philippines, where one of the world's most active volcanoes is spewing lava. So far, nearly 13,000 people that live near the Mayon volcano have left, while tens of thousands of others have been warned they will need to evacuate if the so-called gentle eruption turns into a violent explosion. And now to what so many are calling the miracle in the Amazon, and for such good reason. Listen to this. Four kids, the youngest just 11 months old, were found alive in the jungle after 40 days on their own. Now, this is video the Colombian government released, a video of the moment that they were rescued. Now, those kids uh, were part of an indigenous community. They were also found by an indigenous search team who had been calling out to them in their native languages. Now, the four little ones had been traveling with their mom when their plane crashed after the pilot reported engine failure. That was on May 1st. Tonight, we are learning that the children's mother might have lived for a few days after the crash, encouraging her kids. More on that in just a little bit. But first, the commander of the rescue mission spoke to the Today Show about how the four kids were able to survive. First of all is uh, the wish to maintain a life. The second one is they are indigenous people, so they have immunity to some uh, to some uh, hazards in the inside of the jungle. And third one is they know the jungle, how to survive in the jungle, how to eat, how to drink, how to protect from the rain because. 16 hours per day, just only rain. Only rain. Incredible. NBC's Steve Patterson joins us now with this story. Uh, Steve, first off, how are those kids doing right now? Uh, incredibly well. They're in the hospital recovering, as you might imagine, malnourished, uh, dehydrated, certainly had bug bites on them, going to need a lot of emotional and mental support, but all things considered, uh, in the hospital, communicating. We're here, they're drawing to sort of deal with some of the stress that they underwent and, and doing well. They're going to recover. Oh, wow. And so we heard the commander there talk about the rain, right? Yeah. And so a lot of people were like, 40 days, there's hundreds of people looking for them. How could they miss them? And then you hear the descriptions, just nonstop rain, 16 hours yeah. of rain, these kids uh, hiding uh, from what they thought were possibly predators out there. Uh, what details do we know? How did they survive? What did they eat? Yeah. And kids, as you mentioned, 13 to 11 months That's old. Wild. We bandy around the word hero a lot. But this 13-year-old girl, from what we understand, there is no other other way to describe it. These are tough kids. They know the jungle, as that commander was saying. The 13-year-old girl got some cassava flour from the plane. They used that to eat. They ate some seeds. They hid in tree stumps from the rain and hiding from predators at the same time as well. She's taking care uh, of her siblings while all of this is happening, and they tough it out. And we also learn, you know, as you mentioned, that the mother lived maybe for a few days encouraging them. Uh, here is the word from the father as she Describes he described uh, about maybe what her last days were like and what she said to her children. Listen to this. Lo único que me aclara es que la mamá estuvo cuatro días viva. Entonces, antes de morir, la mamá le dice tal vez, váyanse y usted van a mirar quién es su papá y quién sí sabe qué es amor de papá como se lo demostré a ustedes trayendo a mis hijos. And again, rescue workers finding them uh, days after they found the plane wreckage. Again, you know, obviously beat up and, and are dealing with a long ordeal, but managing to survive thanks to the heroics of this little girl. It's incredible. I, that plane crash, yeah. they found the plane crash first, and then they found footprints, right? And then they found signs that the kids might have been alive. What was the moment like when they, when they all finally found those kids? And, and what was the thing that 
that cracked this case. Yeah, so again, remember a 1,600 mile search, finding the plane, then spreading out in a three mile radius from that plane, finding footprints, finding, you know, diapers and baby bottles and shoes and little things that cued them to the fact that these kids are still alive and they're fighting for their survival. Uh, you know, we don't have the sort of connective tissue to tell us what exactly was the thing that led them to the kids other than we hear a search dog played a really big role in that because the kids aren't communicative yet. They're still recovering, right? But we know it was a joyous moment. The, these rescue workers, the volunteers searching all of that time, they find these kids, they embrace them, they're feeding them as best they can uh, until they can get them out of the, the woods there. Such tiny faces yeah. of absolute resilience. Yeah. Steve, thanks so much. Thanks. And it looks like Ukraine's long-awaited counteroffensive is starting to take shape. Today's Ukraine military said it had recaptured another village in the Donetsk region. And NBC's Ralph Sanchez has more. Ukraine is claiming its first battlefield gains since the start of its long-awaited counteroffensive. The Ukrainian deputy defense minister says a string of seven villages have been liberated over the weekend and into today. These are largely symbolic rather than strategic gains. These are small communities home to a couple of hundred people in some cases. But this gives Ukrainian officials something to point to to show their public that this counteroffensive is making progress. Speaking of symbolism, one of these villages, its name in English translates to the place that gives blessings. And Ukrainian military spokesman says that when the house to house fighting was finished, when the guns went silent, the Russian forces were driven out. The villagers emerged from the basements, the bunkers where they'd been hiding, and they were overjoyed to see Ukrainian troops once again in their community to see the blue and yellow Ukrainian flag flying overhead. We are also seeing the battle field debut of American-made Bradley infantry fighting vehicles. These are vehicles supplied to the Ukrainian military by the United States. Kyiv has been holding them in reserve for the start of the counteroffensive, but we are now seeing the Ukrainians going all in, pushing their best equipment towards the front lines. In one video that we looked at, you can see one of these Bradley vehicles taking a direct hit, we think, from a landmine, but the crew and the troops inside are able to get out safely because of its heavy armor. And one Ukrainian soldier we spoke to says that is just not the case with the Soviet-era equipment that they have been using up until this point, that their older vehicles would have been completely destroyed by a blast like that. Now, the Russian Defense Ministry says it has successfully destroyed a number of these Bradley fighting vehicles, as well as several German-made Leopard tanks. Ukraine is not confirming that, but it is no surprise with an offensive on this scale that some of these vehicles would be lost in combat. Back to you. Ralph Sanchez, thanks so much. An American musician has been arrested in Russia on drug charges. His name is Michael Travis Leak, and the State Department tells NBC News that they're aware of those reports. Now, this musician's arrest comes as the relationship between Russia and the U.S. is as distant and as tense as it's been since the Cold War. And NBC's Keir Simmons has a look. Vladimirovich Putin. Russian President Vladimir Putin at an awards ceremony this morning as American musician Travis Leak becomes the latest U.S. citizen to appear behind bars in a Moscow courtroom. Video shows him denying the charges. I am not admitting to any guilt, and I do not believe that I have done what I've been accused because I don't know what I've been accused of. NBC News cannot verify when the video was made or whether Leak was under duress during the filming. Leak has lived in Russia, making influential rock music. He was even interviewed by the late Anthony Bourdain in 2014. This exchange recorded as a mic fake. No, it's the KGB. They're, they're blocking your signal. I'm quite sure you've had someone on your tail the entire time you've been here. Now, Moscow's court service announcing he is being held on drug dealing charges, facing a sentence of around 12 years. It's unclear whether US diplomats have been granted access to Leak in prison. The State Department telling NBC News in a statement when a US citizen is detained overseas, the department pursues consular access as soon as possible. 
The American government continuing to press for the release of Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich and American businessman Paul Whelan. Last year, WNBA star Brittany Griner spent 10 months in prison, accused of carrying hash oil in a vape cartridge until she was exchanged for a Russian arms dealer. Over the weekend, Russia and Ukraine swapping soldiers. Mum, I'm home, this Russian says, celebrating. While on the front lines, Ukraine's counter-offensive battling to overcome Russian resistance, fighting that will determine both countries' futures. Keir Simmons, thanks so much. Coming up, tracking this storm. Some pretty bad weather is moving through a large part of the country, including a hail river in Colorado. We've got your forecast. But first, you got to see this. Florida is known for some infamous animal encounters, but this might be a new one. Beachgoers uh, in Florida this weekend were shocked to see a black bear going for a swim in the Gulf. Now, that little club splashed around for a bit to the amazement of all of those onlookers nearby. He eventually drifted back to shore, making it his way to the beach, and he ran off into the brush. Must have been unbearably hot. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. Let's get you caught up in 30 seconds. Donald Trump is back in Florida ahead of his arraignment tomorrow over his handling of classified documents. Trump is facing 37 federal felony counts. And four children were rescued in the Amazon jungle in Colombia. They had been stranded there for more than a month after the small plane they were on crashed. And a body was just recovered from that bridge collapse on I-95 in Philadelphia that all started from a truck fire. The victim has not been identified, and it could take months to finish the repairs on that overpass. And tens of millions of Americans are under severe storm threats tonight from Colorado all the way to the mid-Atlantic. We are talking super strong winds, maybe even tornadoes. Students at the University of Colorado Boulder saw some intense hail just a few hours ago. You can see blanketing the campus there, and that hail got mixed in with a lot of heavy rain, flooding some of the streets nearby. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens joins us now. Bill, uh, what are you looking for this evening? And we want to see if any tornadoes form. I mean, we've had the large hail already. Uh, we've had some damaging winds, but we haven't had tornadoes up to this point. We're watching central Texas, and it's going to be a later evening into the overnight hours event. So Dallas, you're here. Notice you're fine for now, but areas to your south is who we're watching. And that will go until about 11 o'clock East Coast time, 10 o'clock Central time for that threat here. So the other areas of concern, we just showed you those pictures from Colorado. The amazing, it's always incredible when the hail just completely can cover the ground. Then if it gets caught up in some heavy rain after that, it can wash away like we saw. And that's been an important Pueblo to Colorado Springs, and those storms are around all the way heading almost into Kansas. we got some isolated severe storms also in New Mexico. And as far as the south goes, we've been watching these storms pushing down through Alabama and Mississippi, and they're going to make it all the way down to the Gulf Coast. A lot of lightning with these two. People kind of forget the dangers with lightning, but that's another issue. So for the rest of this evening, we're watching these storms pushing through the mid-Atlantic. So far, so good. I've not had a lot of severe weather reports. It's just been a little bit of downpours and some heavy rain. But in all, about 27 million people this evening god he's still on alert for severe weather how long do you think that's going to last is that going to go into the week it's an unusual weather pattern. This is almost like an April weather pattern. The areas in the south, we don't usually get severe weather as we head towards the, you know, the summer months here. But tomorrow is going to be another severe weather uh, issue, especially the same exact areas here from Dallas to Shreveport, Louisiana, Mississippi, a good chunk of Alabama, and a good chunk of Georgia, south of Atlanta and up to north Florida. But again, large hail is the threat. That's unusual for this time of year. Typically, it's so warm, it's hard to get big hail. But we got some colder air aloft, and that's where the ice forms, up where the jets fly. And so that's why we could see maybe tennis ball size hail in these areas so by the time we get to wednesday still a little bit of heavy rain in the south some rain we needed rain in the northeast but not as much in the way of severe weather as we head towards friday just isolated strong storms in the northern plains really the worst of the severe weather is now and then tomorrow afternoon and while we've got you uh, i've been seeing something on twitter yeah, generating lot. like a lot <laughs> of talk yeah and it is who knows if, it, if it's something here but it's all about the high water temperatures in the north atlantic you know there's some people that are saying this is uh, gonna spell disaster do you think we should be concerned or is this just a an anomaly 
Uh, as of right now, it's a uh, what's going on, why is it going on, let's let the scientists try to figure it out and everyone else mm. can not freak out about it. But here's the chart that is being shared all across social media. And all you need to know about this chart is that we are where this red X is round. This is not the ocean temperature. In the North Atlantic, that peaks in September. So if you see any headlines saying record ocean temperature, that's a lie because it doesn't happen yet. It's going to be a couple months from now. But compared to this date in June, all these other lines are down here in the last 40 years. So this is the squiggly lines, January to December. So for a lot of different reasons, which we're trying to figure out, some of them are the wind direction, some of them are El Nino, you can see the temperatures really jumped in the last two to three weeks, well higher than any time in the past. Now, Gotti, when we talk about like the scientific record, only 40 years of past history isn't really enough to be like, oh, you know, this is incredible, it's never happened before because we don't have a long enough time period. But this is definitely something that we're interested in, we're trying to figure out why it's happening and, you know, what the effects will be as it is happening. And we'll have to see if this continues, you know, all the way through the rest of the summer. I'm not a scientist, but that does not look good at no. all. Bill Cairns, thanks so much. And the official start of summer is right around the corner. And people from coast to coast are going to be flocking to the beach to celebrate. But a national shortage of lifeguards could impact all the fun in the sun. And NBC's Jesse Kirsch has more. With summer just days away, tonight a reminder that going for a swim is not risk-free after two fathers recently died trying to save their children. In Daytona Beach, Florida last week, Mark Bryson raced to help his son and others battling a rip current in knee-deep water. Everyone made it out alive except Bryson. Mark wanted to make sure that our friends and the kids were, were safe and, you know, and he, he made that happen. And unfortunately, the riptide was just too strong for him. Then just yesterday in New Jersey, officials say a 39-year-old man drowned while trying to rescue his 15-year-old daughter. I still have chills right now. I just came up to the beach to sit and say a prayer. Even a good swimmer can have a bad day. Chicago Fire Department Deputy Chief Jason Locke says not everyone out on the water always has the survival skills they should. And he adds lifeguards are crucial allies. They're our first eyes. A lot of times they'll mitigate the situation before we even show up on scene. And tonight, those lifesavers are in high demand. We're experiencing a critical lifeguard shortage. With over 309,000 parks and pools, half of them are either closing or reducing their hours. The American Lifeguard Association says some places are offering bonuses to attract workers. The association adds even if pools stay shut down, that doesn't mean people will stay out of the water. People still need to cool off, and they will go to areas where there are not lifeguards. Along Lake Michigan in the Windy City, some parents aren't taking chances. If there's no lifeguard yeah. on duty, yeah. is it a non-starter for you at that point? That's correct, yeah. For me, I want to make sure that I have a lifeguard watching my kids. Jesse Kirsch, NBC News. And so far this year, there have been over 30 shark attacks across the world. And it happened to 13-year-old Ella Reed just last month. But you know what? That is not stopping her from getting back into the water, not only to swim, but to swim with sharks. Swim with sharks for science. And here is her incredible story. Dangling over the side of a boat, clipping a tracking device onto an eight-foot tiger shark? That's really cool. Hardly the place you'd expect to find Ella Reed. But for this rising eighth grader, there's no place she'd rather be. I'm super excited in the water. Wild, because just about a month ago, Ella was having a very different shark experience. It went under her and straight to me. Ella and her friend were sitting in waist-deep water at Fort Pierce Inlet State Park near her home when she found herself in the jaws of a four-foot bull shark. Right as it bit me in the stomach, I shoved my arm like where it was biting me so it didn't get my stomach and, and it got my arm instead. And she kept on fighting back. I hit it with my other hand, like hit its nose or its face or something. Ella escaped but was bitten on her stomach, arm, and leg, needing 19 stitches. I was pretty freaked out in the beginning. Ella, however, undaunted. And just 11 days after the attack... I got back into the water, like, the day before I got the stitches out. It's that spirit that led Nova Southeastern University to invite Ella on their shark tagging trip. We thought that maybe that first interaction wasn't quite the best. We would like her second interaction with the shark to be a much more positive one. When I received the invitation to go shark tagging, I was super excited. And why not? Ella's dream is to become a marine biologist. 
I'm hoping to learn their behavior and more about them. And that brings us to this moment. The tiger shark kind of felt like, like leather and sandpaper. It was really weird. And the nurse shark kind of felt like sandpaper too. Ella, less than a month after fighting off a shark attack, was in the water petting another one that was even bigger. Now that she's able to see what marine biology, how you can put that to work and how you really can make a difference. And I just hope it, it helps guide her in the area that she wants to go. As for Ella. Tagging the sharks was like super fun. It was a lot better than the last time I had an experience with another shark. Gotti Schwartz, NBC News. <laughs> Definitely a lot better. Still to come, over the past two years, more than a dozen states have introduced legislation to loosen child labor laws. And we're gonna explain why when we come back. Hey there, welcome back. And here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. As efforts to ban books picks up steam across the country today, Illinois' governor signed a law banning those bans in that state. That makes Illinois the first in the nation to outlaw book bans. That new law is going to take effect at the start of next year. And the fight between Fox News and his former star, Tucker Carlson, is heating up. Fox sent a cease and desist letter to Carlson saying that his new show on Twitter is a breach of contract. One of Carlson's lawyers says Tucker will not be silenced by anyone. And J.P. Morgan Chase settled a lawsuit with victims of Jeffrey Epstein to the tune of $290 million. A woman identified as Jane Doe 1 sued the bank, alleging that it turned a blind eye towards Epstein's behavior. And George Soros is handing control of his $25 billion empire to his 37-year-old son, Alex. The 92-year-old billionaire has been long accused of being part of conspiracies by many on the right. But get this, his son Alex says that he is more political than his dad and is going to continue supporting left-leaning politicians and causes. And last night, the Tony Awards celebrated the best of Broadway. Kimberly Akimbo won Best Musical and Holocaust drama Leopoldstadt won Best Play. Also, history was made during Pride Month. Jay Harrison G. and Alex Newell became the first two out non-binary performers to win in the category of acting. Congratulations to all those winners. Now, how old do you think teens should be in order to work? 16, 15, maybe 14? Well, in some states, they're starting to push to lower the age requirements for a handful of reasons. And Stephanie Gosk explains. The Fridley Movie Theater outside Des Moines is ramping up for a big summer. But finding workers has been a struggle. We used to have stacks of applications. Now we might have two or three. That's why the theater's manager says he and others like him in the service industry fought to change the state's child labor law, making it easier to hire teenagers under 16. A lot of the part of the Iowa Code that dealt with child labor was um, written as far back as 1906. State Rep Dave Dio helped to get a new law passed. I think this is really more about giving uh, students the opportunity if they want to, if they could work a few more hours for one or two evenings. Iowa's new child labor law allows kids under 16 to work more hours in a single day and as late as 9 p.m. during the school year, up to 28 hours a week. Do you have any concerns that some kids may work too much and not pay attention to their education? We didn't increase the number of hours per week. We've left that the same. But it does mean that a 14-year-old could work from 4 until 9 every day after school. What I'm concerned about are children whose families are facing economic desperation. Jen Schur is a labor activist who says kids under pressure to make money for their family could drop out of school. It puts them in a high-risk category for their uh, grade suffering, um, high-risk category for not completing high school. And critics also say the bill relaxes the rules around where kids can work, including allowing light assembly jobs. Iowa is not alone. In the last two years, 14 states have introduced legislation to loosen child labor laws. Five have passed it. All of this coming as the federal government says there has been a 69 percent increase in child labor violations. Those are the situations in which we're seeing teens often recruited and then hired into highly exploitative work that involves excessive hours, illegal um, exposure to either hazards or chemicals. Do you worry that by expanding child labor and changing the law here, it sets a tone that could potentially open the door for 
for companies and industries to take advantage of kids. If they're breaking the law, they're they're breaking the law. This doesn't open it up to allow for, you know, for those type of things. The new law, he says, is written for kids like Asher Hughes. What are you saving up for? Mainly a car right now. A car? Yeah. The 15-year-old works at that movie theater. I'm fine with him working as much as he wants to work, as long as his grades are, are up. Does working until 9 seem late to you? No, not really. It's He doesn't go to bed at 9. I don't no. know any teenager that does go to bed at 9 <laughs> or 10. It teaches responsibility, Shelly Hughes says, and the value of money at a time when businesses say they can really use the help. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, Waukee, Iowa. And last November, a gunman opened fire at a gay bar in Colorado Springs. And during that chaos, Army veteran Richard Fierro tackled that shooter and stopped the rampage. Now, over the weekend, Fierro's heroics were honored by the local LGBTQ community who asked him to be the Grand Marshal at their annual Pride Parade. And NBC's Jay Valley has a story. Last November, Richard Fierro and his family were celebrating a birthday at Club Q, a popular LGBTQ bar that served as a safe haven for the community for over two decades. When he and another brave patron stepped in to disarm an active shooter, saving countless lives. I needed to save my family. And that family was, at that time, everybody in that room. One of the five who were killed in the shooting was Richard's daughter's boyfriend, 22-year-old Raymond Green Vance. I'm humbled beyond belief to be accepted in the community um, and, and asked as a straight dude, you know, to, to grand marshal their parade. Folks are trying to marginalize that community and their arms are wide open for everyone. The parade's theme this year, the power of pride, which relates to the community's ability to stand up again after the tragedy at Club Q. To see that community celebrate themselves and celebrate the culture and everything that goes with it, that's something that can help move us a little more for, further down the road. The community is still reeling from the shooting that occurred a mere seven months ago. Human rights campaign, the nation's largest LGBTQ advocacy group, declared a state of emergency for LGBTQ people in the U.S., sounding the alarm about the current political environment with more than 525 anti-LGBTQ bills introduced and more than 70 bills signed into law so far in 2023. As for Richard, he is sending a message to those who may be undecided about supporting Pride celebrations this month. You don't have to do anything crazy. Just show up. It has nothing to do with whether they're gay or straight or, or whatever. It has everything to do with just being kind. Jay, thank you. Now, they warned it was going to happen, and it is here. If you were sharing a Netflix password, you might need to finally create your own account. But is that move going to lead to new subscribers? That's coming up next, so stay tuned. And now to the infamous password sharing crackdown that's happening over at Netflix. A streaming giant has officially started kicking off users who are borrowing those passwords from family and friends or maybe even exes. And while the move might be rubbing some subscribers the wrong way, New data is suggesting it is paying off pretty big for the company. NBC's Vicky Wynn has the details. Oh no. Oh no. For the estimated 30 million households sharing their Netflix password, I guess it's time I grow up. The dreaded day has arrived. My mother-in-law cut us off Netflix. As the password crackdown ramps up and shuts out users. I can't watch a crocodile documentary that my mom pays for. It all comes weeks after the streaming giant first sent subscribers an ominous email saying your Netflix account is for you and the people you live with, announcing it would now cost an extra $7.99 to share an account with someone outside your household. This is so annoying. This is horrible. But the backlash didn't last. New data from the analytics company Antenna shows Netflix added a stream of new accounts after it shut down sharing, even posting its four highest days of new subscriber additions in the four and a half years since that data has been tracked. Industry insiders say that's good news for Netflix, which took a major gamble by limiting account access. Oh, go on, say you like it. Actually, I love it, yeah. Yes. 
But what this ultimately means for streaming fans is still unclear. Oh, this is stressful. While many believe Netflix's recent subscriber boost will encourage others like Hulu, Prime Video, and NBC Universal owned Peacock to put a stop to password sharing, others say it might be an opportunity for other platforms to cash in on a top competitor. You're going to see these other streamers, their prices are going to go lower and lower to compete with Netflix. And someone's going to say, you know what? I could get Disney Plus for this amount on Netflix, that amount. Which means now may be the best time to shop around and see what best meets your streaming needs. Max dropped HBO from its name, but added several new brands to its library, including the Food and Magnolia Networks. Are you ready to see your picture upper? But even if you're not ready to ditch Netflix entirely, you may be able to save money by downgrading to a cheaper subscription plan and avoid overpaying for a souped up premium subscription. This is a major shift in pricing for Netflix. So if you are going to share with someone outside of your household that extra bucks a month, well, that is more than what you might pay for a new subscription with some of these other streamers. So here's something you can actually try. If you're on the fence about unsubscribing from any of these services, keep your account, but delete the app for a few days. See if you really miss it. Often we just stream surf and bounce around finding place that something to watch. So now is really a good time to figure out if you're actually watching what you pay for. Back to you. And now to a disturbing report out of the Wall Street Journal that found Instagram is being used to connect and promote a network of pedophile accounts. Now, the team at the Wall Street Journal says a lot of it centers around explicit hashtags. And just like the app's algorithm connects you to the things you're interested in, it does the same for those looking for places to find underage pornographic material. Now, in a statement to NBC News, Meta says, quote, we're continuously exploring ways to actively defend against this behavior, and we set up an internal task force to investigate these claims and immediately address them. Joining us now is one of the Wall Street Journal reporters behind this investigation, Jeff Horwitz. Uh, Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. Can you walk us through what your investigation found here? A lot of this seemed to be happening right in the open. Yeah, that's, I think it was very open. So I think... Um, it's important to recognize that Instagram has 1.3 billion users and that there absolutely will be pedophiles among them, um, right? So keeping them off the platform isn't really a possible thing. What we found, however, is that Instagram actually uh, was, wasn't just sort of hosting these people and their attempts to build a community among themselves. Uh, it was actually connecting them um, very aggressively. And so uh, a test account that even looked at a single member of this community. And it feels weird to use that for um, to describe people who are exploiting children, but it really is a community on Instagram. Uh, just doing a single account got Instagram to start recommending connecting to others. Uh, so it was very, very um, open. And as you note, yeah, there were, there were uh, hashtags that were sort of made discovery even easier. So the company had kind of taken its eye off the ball and was uh, literally allowing people to um, search for sellers of underage content using hashtags like pedo whore. Wow. And, and so you mentioned that test account, but one thing that was extremely striking, according to your report, the, the algorithm wasn't just suggesting this to people specifically looking for the content, right? Yeah. So I think something we have in the story here is that niche communities have a very strong gravitational pull um, in social media. So if you're into something obscure, social media algorithms uh, are going to be very good at figuring that out and making sure to serve you lots of it. And so uh, we actually spoke with um, one activist. Uh, her name is Sarah Adams. She um, uh, goes by the handle Mom Uncharted on Instagram. She had um, her followers send her awful things they see from time to time. And she had actually reported one page called Incest Toddlers. And um, uh, in the following days, Instagram started pushing this page, Incest Toddlers, to all of her followers to, to take a look at. And so uh, this obviously is not something the company wants to have happen. Um, they have acknowledged, obviously, they took down the page uh, when we got in touch with them about it. But uh, they say they're working on trying to prevent um, pedophilic users from, I suppose, uh, taking advantage of the platform's community and interest-based targeting uh, to form a larger community than they might otherwise. Now, Meta says it took down almost half a million of these accounts in January alone. 
Realistically, how difficult is it here to track the people behind these accounts and actually stop them from distributing more of this content? Yeah, I think I think the the question is, look, there's always going to be this stuff on the Internet. There always has been. Um, uh, that said, the question is, to what degree does uh, a platform like Instagram facilitate and normalize it? And I think that is a um, that's sort of the question here is like, can, is Instagram going to be functionally a directory for people who have these um, desires that we are, I think, generally pretty good in society at saying, you know, you are not allowed to pursue them. Um, at basically allowing those people to form a worldwide community. And, uh, you know, in terms of the content recommendations and, uh, you know, formation of connections, that's kind of the last thing you want is, is to sort of create that international interest group, shall we say. Such a disturbing and yet important story. Jeff, thanks so much for, for your journalism, brother. Thank you. And that does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you here tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.